everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former senior officers from the U.S. intelligence community and those who write about them. Today, we have a return guest, and I'm very pleased to have him back. His name is Shane Harris. He is a journalist, been working in the journalist field for about 20 years. He is a staff reporter for the Washington Post, covering both intelligence and national security affairs. He was part of the team that won a Pulitzer Prize for public service in 2021, and he's the author of a couple of books, The Watchers and At War. Shane, welcome back to AFIO Now. Thanks for having me back, Jim. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. Shane, there's a lot going on in Russia and Ukraine. It seems like that cauldron is bubbling and may boil over again. Can you update our viewers on some of the latest developments, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and you're right, it is it is a very fast-moving conflict, uh, which is surprising, I think, to, to a lot of people who maybe have been following it in the news, because it's not too long ago we were using, or people were using the term stalemate to kind of describe what was happening in this standoff between <clears throat> Russia and Ukraine. But obviously, it, things are moving very quickly. And as we're speaking now, the developments on the ground are changing almost by the day, which is pretty remarkable. Just to kind of quickly refresh people's memory a little bit on how we got here, you know, back in February, Russia, of course, launched this invasion of Ukraine, which, uh, and we've written a lot about this in the Post recently, you know, Vladimir Putin, it seems fully intended to be a very quick kind of lightning strike where he would seize political control of the capital, uh, topple the Zelensky government, and thereby, I guess, go about installing a puppet regime uh, in Ukraine where his intelligence services were telling him that they were going to be greeted as liberators, where this country still viewed itself as part of Russia and not as an independent state. Uh, obviously, we know now all of those predictions were quite disastrously wrong, and the Ukrainian military showed not just a skill in resisting that invading force, but in repelling it. Uh, and that's kind of where we are right now. So I'll give us, can we talk about three big developments, really, uh, and then we can maybe drill into some of them if you want. Um, one is the just really dramatic Ukrainian territorial gains we've seen in, in recent weeks and months. Uh, the other is this recent recent Russian uh, claim of annexation of uh, four regions in Ukraine, and then the the question of the potential threat of the use of nuclear weapons. Um, but just to start with with the territorial gains, you know, we we've seen the Ukrainians liberating towns. We've seen them repelling Russia most recently from a very strategic city, uh, Liman, which is sort of a kind of a supply chain or logistics hub, if you like, there in the east of the country. Um, these are more than just sort of, you know, liberating villages, all that's been a part of it. What we're seeing also is Russian tanks and Russian soldiers fleeing in the advance of these oncoming Ukrainian forces, uh, which tells you a lot. It tells you that there are that unit cohesion and discipline is probably broken down. It tells you that they're apparently quite afraid of the Ukrainian forces, which are, are not, you know, the sort of plucky upstarts that I think sometimes they were described as in the beginning of the conflict. This is clearly a very well-trained uh, very well equipped with with American and other Western weapons uh, military force that has done a, a pretty remarkable job of not just holding Kiev in the sort of central part of the country and keeping the government intact, but then going in and pushing the Russian forces out of some of this territory in these towns and areas that they claim in the beginning of the invasion. Uh, important to note that we haven't seen them, the Ukrainians, turn to the south and particularly in Crimea, where, of course, Russia had invaded in 2014 and has, and has held that territory. But already you're hearing discussion about turning south. There's a, you know, the region in uh, Kherson and the town of Kherson, which was one of the ones that Russia took over there early in the conflict. That is one of the Ukrainian forces have their eye on liberating now. And again, these sort of regions in the in the east of the country um, where they've been kicking the Russians out, it really demonstrates, I think, that the Ukrainian military highly trained, highly capable. And there's been this clear, it seems to me, kind of cycle that has been established where they have good training from the West and from the United States, and they have this constant supply of weapons, um, particularly this HIMAR system, you know, this more medium range missile system that has proven so effective in the conflict. And that supply chain just kind of keeps going. You know, the United States keeps dipping into the funds that Congress has allocated and supplying weapons to Ukraine. Um, you don't hear as much as you did in the early part of the conflict, it seems to me, where the Ukrainians were saying, we don't have enough weapons, we want more. And it sounded kind of more desperate. Um, they, of course, always want more. And I think they still would like to see 
uh, supply of even more powerful weapons. But it seems like we've entered into this state now where the Ukrainians are making very good use of the equipment that the U.S. is sending them. Uh, I suspect also they'll be making use of the Russian equipment that they have captured as some of these forces have <clears throat> uh, retreated and left tanks and personnel carriers behind. An interesting kind of footnote to that, too, is there will be potentially a very good intelligence uh, gain that comes out of that. Some of these Russian tanks, the equipment that they have on them, the materials that are painted onto their surfaces that, are, that try to make them or help them evade t detection. The United States, I'm told, is going to be studying that and has communicated to the Ukrainians, look, there's basically a list of technologies we'd like, we'd like to have a look at here. So there's going to be an intelligence benefit that comes out of that. There's still the open question, again, from an intelligence point of view that I find really compelling and we haven't got an answer to yet, is for all of the successful analysis and prediction, although we don't like to use that word, I know, in the intelligence business, that the U.S. and Britain in particular provided on the likelihood that Russia would invade. Clearly, I think that the U.S. and its allies thought that this war might be over pretty quickly and that the Ukrainians would be outmatched and outgunned by the Russian forces. And there was obviously a big overestimation of Russian military capability at the beginning of the war. You know, Director of National Intelligence of Real Haynes has said that the intel community is going back and doing a kind of after action port and an assessment to say, like, well, why did we essentially get that wrong? Why did we overestimate their capabilities so much? Um, that is still ongoing. I suspect there have probably been some answers to that that, that we just haven't learned yet. But that still is a big, important question. And to my mind, even becomes more so as we see these remarkable Ukrainian advances and this just total seeming breakdown of the Russian military, or you know, at least in these kind of key strategic areas. Why did the US think this Russian military was so capable and so formidable? And what is that gonna tell us going forward, not just about its capabilities, but about the leadership of the military, um, its willingness to engage in, in the conflict for uh, the foreseeable future. You get into Kremlinology a little bit here and the questions of whether Vladimir Putin is really hearing from any of his inner circle of advisors. Uh, you got to wrap this up or it's not going the way we thought. But clearly the Russian population understands that this special military action that, as Putin keeps trying to call it rather than a war, is not going in the direction that they had hoped. You've seen recently Putin mobilize up to 300,000 troops or forces, a, a kind of a mobilization that U.S. intelligence officials had told me over the summer they felt that he was resisting, but probably understood or maybe didn't understand, frankly, that he needed to do if he had any hope of achieving any of his strategic objectives. So he seems to have come to some realization that he has to do this now. And that is not going well. You have seen protests in the streets in Russia, uh, particularly in some regions that I think are that the conscripted force is disproportionately pulled from. I'm thinking of places like Dagestan, for instance, where the people are really uh, objecting to this. And, and I don't want to say that this is an uprising because it's of course it's being pretty, you know, put, put down pretty brutally in some cases. But you're seeing a tremendous public backlash to this and a realization even among, I think, what passes for the Russian intelligentsia, the chattering class in the media, that this war is not going as planned. And these are important political pressures to keep in mind that are coming to bear on Putin because he knows that he has to prosecute this war uh, without significant cost uh, to uh, the upper classes, certainly, and the middle classes in Russia. He is pulled disproportionately from ethnic minorities and lower classes in the country. Uh, and he cannot project anything of an air of uh, indecisiveness or inability to prosecute this war against the country. So those political forces are bearing on him. That remains to be seen and is extremely fluid and potentially very dangerous. That kind of leads into the second point I wanted to talk about uh, of note lately, which is this frankly bizarre and 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 in some respects quite alarming uh rally if you want to call it that putin held recently in moscow where he announced uh that russia was annexing four portions of ukraine where there had been these sham referenda uh where the kremlin claimed that the the residents of these areas clearly voted decisively that they wish to be a part of russia and said officially now they are and that they will be citizens of russia forever I call this alarming, not so much in the sense that he made this claim, which I, I think certainly is not recognizable under international law and most countries think is you know, ridiculous, but rather um, the rhetoric that accompanied it. It was 
sort of the the height of conspiratorial thinking. I mean, he was using words like Satanist to describe the United States and, and painting the conflict as one that was this kind of epic battle between good and evil uh, in the West and Russia. I mean, kind of, if you will, amplifying some of the themes that he's played on before of this kind of, you know, us versus them idea about the war, but really just cranking it up several notches. I think that that really alarmed analysts in the West because of the volume and the ferocity of it. Almost immediately, these claims become tested because the Ukrainian military starts kicking out Russian forces in some of the key towns and areas in these very territories that Putin claims that he's annexed. Um, and on the one hand, I mean, it really underscores the kind of farcical nature, I think, of, of Putin's claims and just going out and, and boldly saying this is part of Russia, but also alarming because it's clearly backing him into a corner. Um, he cannot be seen, I think, in his mind by his people as someone who comes out and makes bold pronouncements that he cannot then back up. Uh, the question would be obvious to, to, to Russians who are looking at the question honestly and who, might, and who are getting honest media about it, and that's a challenge. Um, how can you claim that we control and annex these territories when our forces are running away from them? That kind of puts more pressure, I think, again on him to do something drastic. Um, and what do I mean by that? There, there's always been this question, I think, since the beginning of the conflict, the beginning of the war, of, you know, is Putin holding back something? You know, it, 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 and one question was always, would he actually do a general mobilization of forces? That was, I think, a lot of U.S. officials saw as being a significant step if he did that, essentially saying, I'm going to put more troops into the conflict be they cannon fodder or otherwise, to try and just force this through manpower to take back some of these these areas. He's done that. It doesn't seem to be working. The question then becomes whether or not he would actually resort to uh, the, the ultimate weapon, which is the use of nuclear weapons. And that's kind of like the third thing that I think about lately. I'll say at the outset, count me in the group that I, I do not believe in journalists making predictions. <laughs> I think we should stay away from that the same way that intelligence officers like to stay away from it. But I don't see that Putin has a strong incentive at this point to use nuclear weapons in the war. And I think he has several powerful disincentives working against him. To, to go back to that bizarre rally in Moscow where he announced the annexation, he hinted not so subtly that Russia was prepared by any means necessary, I think it was his phrase, to protect these territories and to protect its claim that they're part of Russia. And that was clearly interpreted as him saying, I'm willing to use nuclear weapons. And some people in his administration were a bit more explicit about that in the in the days after the speech. This is not the first time that he has rattled a nuclear saber. We can go back to the beginning of the war. Within days of the invasion, Putin met with his, you know, publicly met with his military leaders and ordered them to raise the strategic alert level of, of Russian nuclear forces, which was incredibly alarming at the time. I mean, this as this as this happened, it, it raised all kinds of concerns uh, in the United States and in Europe. Of, you know, are we suddenly are we potentially entering the, you know, the brink of nuclear war here with Russia? U.S. intelligence officials, according to my reporting, never detected any signs that the military followed through with that order in any kind of tangible way, which is to say you didn't see a kind of readying of forces, you didn't see a movement of the materials, the kind of logistical chain moving into to, to action that we would expect to see if he was preparing to use nuclear weapons on the battlefield. I don't want to say it looked like a bluff, but it looked like more of a rhetorical gesture that was meant to send the message to the West, I'm willing to do this, but it seemed like Putin was not taking the physical steps to move forward with it, which I think probably was read more as he understands that if he does start to take those steps, we're going to be entering into a different phase of the conflict. I think Putin is not crazy. U.S. intelligence officials I've talked to do not believe that he's lost control, of, lost touch with reality. I think he was profoundly misinformed about how this war would go for him. I don't think he invaded Ukraine on a lark. You know, I've had a number of people point out to me, they say, well, how could he have been so crazy as to invade Ukraine and think that he could hold it? And, you know, I don't want to get into apples to oranges comparisons here, but, you know, the United States invaded Iraq in 2003 and thought that would go very differently than it did as well. You know, what I mean by this is that even large militaries and presumably sophisticated governments make mistakes in their analysis and overestimate their own capabilities. I don't think that, you know, Putin's 
invasion of Ukraine was madness, and I don't think that he's mad now when he threatens about the use of nuclear weapons. <laughs> Again, in the instance where we saw him talk about this recently in the rally in, in Moscow, according to U.S. intelligence officials that have been that I've spoken to, and we've seen other reports in this in recent days. We have not seen any real movement yet of the kinds of forces that you would expect or the kinds of equipment you would expect to see if he actually were going to follow through and make good on that threat. That does not mean that the United States you know, considers that an empty threat. We have been had reporting in the Post that the Biden administration has been communicating privately to Russia that there will be severe consequences if they were to use a nuclear weapon. Um, we don't know what those consequences are. I think Vladimir Putin probably has some idea whether or not the United States directly told him what they would be or not. You know, there are decades of you know, nuclear strategy and wargaming and kind of signaling and understanding that probably inform his understanding of how we would respond if he were to actually use a nuclear weapon. You know, if he were to take a low yield tactical nuclear weapon and try and use it against Ukrainian forces, First of all, there's a question of whether it would even do much good. You know, he's not going to turn the tide of the war with one low yield nuclear detonation. And as terrifying as that would be, there's a decent chance that if the forces he was aiming at were not that the forces that were outside even the blast radius of that detonation wouldn't be completely destroyed. It would be, again, terrifying, but it would not be cataclysmic necessarily. I think the winds probably blow east in Ukraine. So there's a question about whether or not the fallout from such a detonation would go back over Russia. And I think that Putin probably understands that there's a decent chance that if he did something like this, the United States might decide to enter the conflict. There's actually a great piece that we recently ran on The Atlantic that I would recommend to your, your listeners by Eric Schlosser, where he kind of took the pulse of various officials, including people who had served in very important positions in the U.S. government in the Cold War. And the consensus opinion seemed to be that there was a decent chance that the United States would not respond in kind with a nuclear weapon, but potentially would come in conventionally and start to eliminate all Russian forces in Ukraine, that we would basically enter the side finally of the war on the side of Ukraine. Uh, and then, you know, you could argue that we're at war with Russia, but it would be limited to Ukraine potentially. I think Putin understands that and knows that. And so that's, that's, uh, yeah, this is why I am not persuaded that what we're seeing from him right now is that he is about to launch a nuke. At the same time, and you and I were briefly discussing this before we began the conversation, the fact that we are even having to contemplate this, the fact that the president of Russia is threatening the potential use of a nuclear weapon in Europe in the year 2022 is extraordinary. Uh, it is not something U.S. officials take lightly. It has not changed their posture, but it's not something that they've dismissed. So this is kind of where we are now, where... I think safe to say most people not in Ukraine thought you would not see the Ukrainian military uh, making these kinds of gains. I don't want to say that they're on the cusp of victory. I'm not even sure what victory would look like. I don't know that there is a real potential at this point for kicking out all Russian forces from in the entirety of Ukraine. But certainly, you know, the gains continue on the Ukrainian side. The Russians keep fleeing. The mobilization is not going well. The annexation looks preposterous on its face. Russia can't really back it up. And this threat is looming out there of what might Putin do next. So it is incredibly fluid, incredibly dynamic. For intelligence officers, this has to be a huge challenge of not just how do they try and understand how to assist Ukraine, which until U.S. intelligence has been doing in the war, but also trying to game out what Putin might actually do, whether in a conventional or a non-conventional sense. So Hopefully, by the time people are listening to this, the situation will not have changed dramatically again. Uh, it's entirely possible. But this is just a far more dynamic situation than it was even a few months ago. And, and certainly then we thought it would be in February when the war began. Jay, that's a great wrap up. Thanks very much. In your view, what's the importance of the attack on the Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines? Who has the capability to do it? Who gains from it? And might we see other attacks against um, other infrastructure uh, pieces uh, in Europe? Yeah, this is an, an extremely intriguing situation. As listeners will remember, there were these attacks that I think have widely been concluded to be the result of sabotage, as officials uh, have said, on these two pipelines underwater. Uh, we've seen the images of you know gas leaking out of them and coming to the surface. The question of who stands to gain from it, you know, is an interesting one. Look, look, count me in the in the crowd that says that 
Capabilities, intentions, and motives generally point to Russia <laughs> uh, as having done this or some kind of a Russian proxy. Uh, for starters, it appears that the, the, the pipeline was really quite deep in, in the water. My understanding is that it may have been as deep like that five miles down. So you're talking about the technology to do this would apparently be some kind of submersible, whether it be, you know, a remote piloted submarine or a physical submarine going down and damaging the pipeline. Um, so that immediately kind of, you know, starts to, you know, uh, rule in and rule out certain actors who might have done this. These pipelines were not carrying gas that Russia was selling. So there is potentially, a, you know, some people have said like, well, why would Russia try to damage pipelines when what it wants to do is ultimately be able to sell, sell gas to the West? But these were not, you know, active pipelines in that sense. Uh, and Russia has use the threat of cutting off energy already uh, as a tool of leverage against the West. Uh, winter is coming and there are a lot of citizens in Europe that depend on their fuel and their energy that's being imported from Russia. And that's still a vital source of income for Russia. So energy has clearly been you know, a factor that Putin has used uh, in the conflict, which is why I think it makes some sense that actually it, as potentially nearsighted as it might seem. If you if you go with a theory of why would Russia do this, I think the answer might be, well, they don't suffer any near term economic consequences for it. And it basically sends a signal to the West that we are willing to actually take extraordinary action to damage infrastructure to hurt you. And we can do it, which then leads to your question of what else could they hit? You know, there are other pipelines. Um, they could simply stop moving you know, fuel and gas uh, to the West. They could just cut it off. We haven't seen uh, large scale cyber attacks so far in the conflict. No one, I think, rules that out at this point. I think that a rather sophisticated act of sabotage on a pipeline lets you makes you imagine that Russia could potentially launch cyber attacks on the power grid in Ukraine, um, try to undermine its energy infrastructure. Again, we haven't seen them, but I don't I haven't heard anybody say there's reason why we wouldn't expect them other than it could lead to retaliation by the United States or by the West with cyber attacks in Russia. But I think it does send that message. There's also been this question about grain exports, I think, from Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians have said that they feel that Russia is trying to thwart the export still of grain out of the country, which is both a source of income for Ukraine and also uh, provides vital food and resources to other countries, particularly in Africa. Russia could potentially say we're going to we're going to disrupt that again. So these things are kind of all on the menu. What I, I, I think is interesting, if, if Russia is behind the Nord Stream attacks, it's a very dramatic display, isn't it? I mean, it's something that is not, uh, it, it plays well on television, to be frank about it. Cyber attacks are hard to see. Uh, blockades of ports are, are kind of hard to convey the effects of that because they kind of have ripple effects with the long tail. Seeing gas bubbling up from underneath the sea sends a message, I think, <clears throat> to people in the West that uh, you know, we, we can hit you. We can even hit you in international waters if we want. There's not been an assessment on who did it, but clearly it is an act of sabotage. And I think that Russia has some pretty powerful incentives for doing it. Shane, clearly this uh, conflict is not close to being over mm -hmm. and has the potential to take a number of new twists and turns literally at any moment. What are some other critical indicators? What are other tripwires that our audience should be aware of and watching um, as this, these things develop uh, in the coming days and weeks? So I think one of the first one of the key things to watch really is, is the continued difficulties that Russia has with calling up forces in this mobilization. I mean, again, the Kremlin has said, Putin has said he wants as many as 300,000 men called up for military service. Watching how that actually goes, watching the steps that Russia takes to try and squelch the protests and to try and stop fighting age men uh, at the border from leaving the country is going to be a pretty powerful indicator. Um, I should also say they, they've said they're calling up fighting age men, but there's clearly anecdotal reporting that they're calling up people who are well beyond the age that we would consider fighting age, in some cases even disabled uh, people. So this is both not playing well uh, amongst the Russian population and also is clearly an indication that the mobilization itself is either not working as planned or is disingenuous. Uh, and it could be both, frankly. And also key to kind of watch how this is playing, I think, in Russian media. I mean, you've seen people who are normally reliable, 
kind of mouthpieces or supporters of Putin and his strategy and are pretty uncritical, frankly, in their reporting on him, to put it mildly, already questioning how this is going. Uh, now, there's one way to look at that is that that is them trying to put pressure on Putin to kind of take the gloves off, to do something like the mobilization, to, in their mind, get serious about it. But watching the rhetoric and how that changes, particularly if it starts to take a flavor of questioning Putin's leadership, that would be a very dramatic signal, I would think. So far, I don't think we've seen anything quite that severe. That would tell you that something really powerful may be happening. Obviously, looking continued at the Ukrainian gains, how much more territory are they taking? And do they plan to launch an offensive both to liberate entirely some of the regions in the east I and mean, we're talking today um, they've liberated this town of Liman and already you're seeing the Ukrainians talk about going into the Luhansk province to try and mount an offensive there that's going to be really key to see do they start mounting offensive into these regions to try and take the fight more directly to Russia and do they turn to the south as well there's been talk about that but so far we have not seen the kinds of gains on Ukraine's side in the south, as we've seen more in these eastern and northeastern areas. So that's another one to watch. And then lastly, I would just say like on the nuclear piece of this, certainly the indicators that the intelligence community is watching are, does Putin take the steps that we would accept to expect to see the movement of people and material and machinery, the signaling that might take place if you were actually preparing to, to use nuclear weapons? I actually think that there's a strong likelihood that if the U.S. intelligence community detected those movements, that they would make those public. You know, we talked before uh, on your show about the extraordinary ways in which the United States declassified, downgraded and declassified and publicized intelligence about what Russia was doing. It's it's uh, build up in the war, potential use of false flag operations, Ukraine. Then they did that as a kind of way to both hopefully deter, but more to the point, restrain Russia from taking certain actions. I think you could see that here again. It makes all the sense in the world to me that if the U.S. had evidence that Putin was preparing or putting pieces in place to potentially use a nuclear weapon, that the U.S. would call him on that and would try to bring pressure to bear on him for that. I don't know that it would deter him, but certainly that is a very strong signal to watch. And then just lastly, you always have to listen to the words that Putin is using. And I go back to that rally that he held recently in Moscow, where I said, you know, the rhetoric gets so incredibly amplified. Is this someone who feels he is in a corner? Is this someone who feel who appears to be desperate? These are things to try and, and, and intuit in what he's saying. And it's very hard to do. It's extremely hard as, as your as intelligence officers and your listeners will know to try and read into the mind of a leader. Uh, but clearly, I think probably Russia watchers are hanging on every word that he's saying to try and understand, does he feel cornered? Um, because it's a cornered Putin that might actually resort to some of these uh, extreme and unthinkable measures that we've been contemplating. Well, that has been a very thorough and thoughtful review of a set of circumstances that really have captured the uh, the national imagination. I would like to thank Shane Harris and the Washington Post um, once for, again for appearing on AFIO now. And I think we may need to get you back again if things continue to develop. Happy to do it anytime. It's always good to talk with you. Thanks very much.